Hi, everyone. My name is Byron Kamenek. I'm the owner and manager of Jack Solar Garden here in Boulder County, Colorado, and the director of our Colorado Agrivoltaic Learning Center. Um, our, our mission is to help showcase the coupling of renewable energy and solar energy with agricultural and conservation goals so that we can help inspire and educate folks around how we can better use our lands within solar arrays for benefits uh, beyond just clean energy or a lot of the benefits that the three gentlemen on the phone or <laughs> on the Zoom call today will talk about. Uh, our main pillars are, are providing education of folks within our communities where we have a variety of tours throughout the course of the season, as well as different events that we'll talk about. We have uh, a staff that uh, works on bringing out fifth graders through 12th graders. We've had over a thousand kids come out to visit us over the past couple of years. And we'll have more coming out this year, which we're really looking forward to providing uh, educational curriculum to, to teachers uh, up and down the front range, as well as anywhere else that wants to pull it off of our website. And we also work with policymakers so that uh, everything that we learn here on site, we can help share that with policymakers so that they better understand how to use our taxpayer dollars for the benefit of all of us. Uh, as I was just mentioning, here's a, a broad swath of the different activities that we do from having farm to table dinners to uh, kids on site. We have an artist on the farm program that uh, last year we had a painter on the farm that brought out people to do uh, painting classes. I'll, I'll be selecting our new artists on the farm here in the next couple of weeks and making that public. We also have a, a variety of online videos that you can access uh, for free on our website, www.coagrivoltaic.org. And as I mentioned, we have events. So coming up uh, on May 30th and 31st, uh, a couple of the fellows that you see on the call here, they'll be here at our solar developer agrivoltaic workshop where this is for the public. Folks can come in. We simply target uh, the conversation towards solar developers, but it's um, open for anybody to be able to join in. It's an in-depth experience of learning more about agrivoltaics here at Jack Solar Garden from design, research activities, daily operations, and what we see as the future of agrivoltaics. We'll even go to uh, North Boulder where there is a retrofit agrivoltaic site that uh, the plants will just be waking up around that time. On July 20th, we will be hosting our second annual Be Original Boulder County uh, Celebration of Innovation on site where we'll have um, folks available to come out, get to learn more about different uh, organizations in our community that are doing innovative things towards uh, sustainability, climate change initiatives, renewable agriculture, so that we can better, better have our, our community aware of what's happening within our community. We have a variety of upcoming webinars. Looks like we're taking a break in April and June. Uh, but we have agrivoltaics and social justice scheduled for May 16th, and folks from the University of Arizona will be discussing their findings at Jack Solar Garden, and we'll be looking towards uh, discussing cattle within solar arrays come September 19th. All of this is important because of that policymaker side. Folks are... Um, Folks are beginning to write more rules, regulations, and providing uh, incentives to different types of agrivoltaics uh, here in Colorado, as well as around the country. And the better informed policymakers are around what uh, practitioners' definitions are of agrivoltaics or ecovoltaics, the, the more, or I should say, the, the better projects that we'll get for the money that taxpayers are putting in towards them. So having good, clean definitions is important and thinking towards the future of what we want these sites to look like in 20 or 30 years versus just what we want them to look like next year is vital for our policymakers to better understand. Uh, I wanted to share a little bit about uh, some upcoming initiatives that we have. We are working on investing in land access to solar arrays where we have um, a, a new, new staff member coming on board shortly to conduct outreach in Adams County, Boulder County, Morgan County, and Weld County uh, to find immigrant and Latinx communities that might be interested in working with us as well as solar companies to uh, have access to these lands to kickstart some uh, agribusinesses within them. So if you are a solar asset owner here on the front range of Colorado, please reach out to me because we are still looking for uh, additional owners to work with on this type of project. 
Uh, further, uh, we've been doing an assessment of all 64 counties in Colorado as to how they do their solar siting code. And now we are uh, beginning the, the work of drafting up model land use code language. Uh, this summer, we'll, we should have that draft ready to engage with stakeholders and hopefully uh, publish that out come, oh, uh, October, hopefully, uh, so that folks can see what we think uh, uh, model land use code language for counties on how they permit solar on farmlands could be. And hopefully that helps streamline the process for uh, counties approving projects. Uh, all of this is done with donor support. So if you enjoy these webinars, please consider donating to the Colorado Agrivoltaic Learning Center. It helps us be able to continue putting on these webinars, providing educational opportunities for kids, uh, doing outreach to policymakers, and uh, focusing in on our initiatives that will help expand agrivoltaics here in Colorado and hopefully further afield. Uh, I always love to point out that Walton Family Foundation has been an important donor to us over the past few years. Um, we appreciate their um, we appreciate their funding and their support. Today's webinar will discuss uh, grassland ecology in our solar right here at Jack Solar Garden. We have uh, Christopher Toy, uh, Matthew Sergio, Alex Seegers that are all uh, PhD students at uh, Colorado State University and have been working out here for a few years. Alex, I guess you started up last season here while uh, Matt and Chris have been out here since the beginning of it. Uh, and they'll be, I believe we go Matt, then Alex and Chris to, to uh, get this going, but I won't provide uh, more introductions than that for those fellas. Um, Matt, uh, you all will be able to introduce yourselves a little bit further and uh, just want to say I appreciate you all uh, joining in today, being a part of uh, our activities and sharing out about agrivoltaics. Um, we'll have this recording up sometime next week. And you can go and visit our website for additional information. From there, I'm going to stop share. Matt, you're up, friend. Go ahead and uh, share. And uh, Matt, Matt, Alex, and Chris will be talking for about 15 minutes a piece. And then afterwards, we'll have Q&A. So throughout this, please feel free to put in your uh, questions uh, in the Q&A button. And uh, at the end of all these talks, we'll get it back around to the questions. Thanks. Go ahead, Matt. Sweet. Thank you, Byron. Thanks for the handoff. Um, I guess what Byron meant to say was that I dragged Alex out into the solar array and made him start sampling some soil stuff. So yeah, so it'll be exciting to hear what he has to say after me. But yeah, first things first, working at Jack Solar Garden has been great. I work in this area that you're looking at right now, which is the grassland area. So I'll tell you a little bit more about it in a second. But the reason why we want to actually study this system is if we look at agri agrivoltaics land use in general in the United States, you can break them up into two simple categories of grazing and pollinator habitat and also crop production. And if we look at that on a land use area, you have about 43,000 acres that takes up grazing and pollinator habitat and about 72 acres that takes up crop production. So obviously the crop production side of this is probably gonna grow. A lot of this has a lot of sustainability um, implications, so that's a good thing. But right now, when we think about the amount of land use and what's gonna change and what we can do to spare land and make sure that it stays functional is looking at these grazing and pollinator habitat sites. So we look at the co-location of grasslands and solar, specifically in this part of the world. In Colorado, we have this semi-arid climate so it's high evaporative demand and limited rainfall. So everything is water limited. So typically more water, more plant production, less water, droughts are really bad, really bad for the economy, really bad for agriculture, really bad for grazing, all of it, right? So if we look at Jack's solar garden specifically, it's dominated by this C3 perennial grass, which is just a fancy way of saying it grows in the cool season. So the early season, uh, it's called bromosinermis, so smooth brome. And it's historically been planted here for hay production but it gives us this really interesting system to be able to look at the same plant across all these dynamic microenvironments. And then of course, there's some pictures of us doing some research and posing for pictures there on the side. Uh, and then if we think about these dynamic microenvironments that we have at Jack Solar Garden, we have them because these panels track the sun from east to west across the sky. So this is just a time-lapse of the uh, crop folks actually doing real work out there, not what we do where we just sit around and wait every hour and take a measurement. <laughs> You'll see them flying around in this video. 
But what you can notice is the shade moves throughout the day. So now the shade at noon is directly under panels and the shade moves outside of underneath the panels into the inner space. And that happens consistently every day when the sun is shining. And the other really cool part about this is that you get heterogeneity when rainfall happens. So what we can look at in this figure is thinking about how if the rainfall happens in the morning, it, hap it drops on that eastern edge when panels are facing east. If it happens in the afternoon when the panels are fo facing to the west, it falls on that western edge. And in Colorado, we get a majority of our rainfall in the afternoon, so it goes to that west edge. There's also a lot of implications for timing of what temperature that these plants are going to be photosynthesizing in and the just amount of light in general. If you're in that inner space between the rows of panels, you're getting a lot more sunlight than you are directly beneath the panels. And then this is just a fun picture of us holding bags of grass because that's what we do as grassland ecologists. And then if we think about this in an ecological perspective, so not just thinking about it in the like, what is yield, we can think about it as some of the experiments that we've done in the past in grassland ecosystems. So we don't just have experience with these large drought experiments. So on the left there, you can actually see a picture of one of our rainout shelters and the grass that's dying underneath it because it's not getting any rainfall. And we can use these to manipulate uh, rainfall. We can take them on, put them back, or we can take them off, put them back on if we want to change the dynamics of rainfall throughout the season. And then we also, believe it or not, water the grass in <laughs> these short grassland ecosystems in Colorado. Try not to get distracted by the cute dog. And then we also have these research questions then that we come up with. So first and foremost, we need to understand how do these PV panels actually redistribute water and sunlight? Then when we know that, we can actually think about how does the water and sunlight microenvironment under these panels alter patterns of product productivity, which is important for agriculture and grazing. And then can we provide some sort of mechanistic insight using physiology? So measuring the physiology of plants to understand their response to these uh, patterns of microenvironment to give us a mechanistic insight. So this is a pretty complicated looking figure, but just focus on the lines that are going across the figure. Um, these T post looking things, these T's, those are actually solar arrays. <laughs> That's as good as I can do in a figure to make solar arrays look like solar arrays. And then underneath them is the different subsections that we measured the first time we ever went out there. And don't worry, the figures get a little bit prettier. This is just our first run at things. But what you should notice right away is that this western edge, the edge that's going to tip down in the afternoon and drop all that rainfall, has the highest soil moisture. The inner space between has the highest amount of sunlight. And that the highest productivity is actually on that eastern edge. So the, the area that doesn't receive the most precipitation redistribution, but does receive morning sunlight. So after we did all those patterns, as I said, we cleaned up some of these things in years 2022 and 2023, and we just decided to go after these discrete microenvironments where we're seeing the biggest differences. So if I show you this figure again, you'll notice that around the panel is where we're seeing the biggest change, the biggest differences in um, those bars are grassland productivity. So that's just total biomass over time. So we just looked at these discrete microenvironments. So between the inner, between the panel rows, the most sunlight, that western edge where the most rainfall falls, beneath the panels where it's limited by water and by sunlight, the eastern edge that gets morning sunlight, and again, between. So if we look at these across three years of data, the interesting pattern that we end up seeing is that across three years, that eastern edge is consistently the most productive. And that's actually a really unique thing in ecology to get a very consistent signal like this. Uh, you'll notice that some of the patterns are a little bit different or they're a little bit muted. And I'll tell you about that in a second. But what this is telling us is that in this ecosystem, that Eastern edge that doesn't get the most, um, the most redistribution of water actually benefits from the shade that it gets in the afternoon. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that too. But what you might be wondering here in 2023 is why these patterns are a little bit more muted, why that eastern edge isn't significantly higher than the rest. And that has to do with the third most rainfall in recorded history in Longmont, where Jack Solar Garden is located. Uh, and in a water limited system, if everything is very wet, then it becomes a light limited system. And it wasn't really light limited here either. This was like the most productivity we've ever seen at the site in all these different locations. So a little bit of a little... <laughs> chink in the armor, but I think 
the same sort of pattern as what we're seeing. And if we ever get a drier year like we did in 2021 over here, you can really see those patterns show up. All right, and then I sort of hinted at this earlier, but why are we seeing these patterns? Like what can we gain from ecological insight of this? And if we think about this just across the time of day, so if you think about from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. in the middle of summer, you're gonna have this really drastic sweep up of temperature and also with evaporative demand. So as temperature goes up, it also gets drier in Colorado. And what that means is that plants that are gonna get that sunlight in the morning, so that's that blue bar, they're gonna be photosynthesizing in a much cooler and more humid microenvironment than the plants that are gonna be getting sunlight in the afternoon on that west edge when it's hotter and drier. And there's a couple other things about this too. So a lot of the physiological insight that we have has to do with water status and how stressed out plants are, but there's also a temperature optimum thing going on here. So cool season grasses like this brome, smooth brome that grows at Jack's actually has a temperature optimum that's much more likely to be 30 degrees or a little bit less than 30 degrees. And if we look at this temperature data that we have from leaf temperature across the entire growing season, inside of the array across all of those different microsites is actually four degrees centigrade cooler than just control plots outside. So these leaf temperatures are staying cooler. And if we think about this in the scale of distributions for temperature optimum for photosynthesis, then we're actually exceeding that for a C3, so a cool season grass in this system and control areas. So a lot of the physiological insight ties back into the ecological perspective, ties back into the like, what is yield, what is biomass, and like, why are we seeing these patterns? So that's pretty interesting. And one more thing that I really wanted to cover before I pass this off to Alex and it gets into the below ground stuff is some of the new stuff that we've been working on. And this is actually has to do with the medicinal herbs that are in a different section of Jack Solar Garden. So I think probably a year and a half, two years ago, Byron decided that we would go ahead and start planting some medicinal herbs. And there's a lot of different medicinal herbs up there, but I think the, the two that we focused on were lemon balm and peppermint. But what's really interesting and didn't happen last year is we're going to have some that are uh, irrigated and non-irrigated. So we're going to understand how water use changes through these different medicinal herbs. But more importantly to us, because we're really interested in ecological questions, is how this secondary metabolite production changes over time. And secondary metabolites, the way you can think about this differently between primary metabolites is primary metabolites are like plant food. They need that to survive. A secondary metabolite can be regulated through environmental re, uh, interactions and also with biotic interactions. So that could be herbivory, some type of pollinator that needs something or needs a resource or like light and water, right? So that's why we're interested in looking at this in a PV array. So one example of this could be pollinators and pests. This like environment plus biotic interaction can alter the phenolic composition and a ph phenolics are actually a part of that secondary metabolite. And that can alter pollinator preference. So that's like very important. A lot of these sites are going to be pollinator friendly sites. And then also, this is a really big one too, thinking about agriculture and how it can alter secondary metabolites. If you had coffee this morning, or if you're drinking coffee right now, a lot of the really nice fancy coffee is shade grown. And shade grown means that you can regulate the caffeine and flavor profile, like phenolic composition again, and all the hormonal composition with shade. So if we think about how this might influence different crops and different biotic interactions like pollinators and pests and solar arrays, it's probably going to be pretty influential and not a lot of people are looking at this yet. So what we're going to do with Jax is use, well, <laughs> I'm not going to do it. Kelly's going to do it. So Kelly's one of the uh, really exceptional undergrads that we have in the lab right now. And she's been managing this whole project. But um, what she's going to do is look at these, um, west center and east beds so the ones that receive morning noon and afternoon light and try to understand how the different timing of light and the different temperature and humidity and interactions there alter the phenolic composition of peppermint and lemon balm and these both have opposite interactions with um, light and phenolic composition so one of them is gonna one of them is predicted to have higher phenolic composition in the shade, one is predicted to have higher um, uh, phenolic um, 
composition in the uh, sunlight. So it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. We're still trying to process these samples and we sampled a lot from last year um, and then trying to think about going forward in different systems, how we can use some of the secondary metabolite information to test broader questions about ecological processes in large scale arrays. So that's sort of all I have for the actual research stuff. I have a ton of other research that we've done at JAX. I just, you know, limited to a little bit of time, but I'm happy to talk about some of the grazing stuff and some of the uh, forage quality. I think Chris is going to get to that as well. But more broadly, I think that what comes next after all of this is like more research. Like we have more questions now about the interesting patterns that we see in solar arrays and we want to explore them more. Uh, and then the next after that is making progress in the actual like application of these sites. So it's a lot of the work that Byron's been doing and a lot of the stuff that we've been seeing through different uh, experiments is that like if you don't grade sites, especially in these water limited uh, sensitive ecosystems, then you can actually bounce back the ecosystem a lot faster and potentially design arrays in an ecovoltaic approach that can um, enhance these ecosystem services, again, which Chris will talk about in a little bit here. But And then what, what it really comes down to is sharing that knowledge with everyone that's either here or policymakers like Byron was talking about, trying to get adoption, trying to facilitate a better way to do solar energy that's more ecologically informed. So that's what I got for you right now. Uh, this is just kind of a little plug for my <laughs> dissertation that I'm going to be presenting on April 4th. Um, if you want more information, if that QR code doesn't scan right now, I'm happy to share it. It's also on LinkedIn as well. But yeah, so if anyone has questions about that stuff, always happy to talk about it. Thanks, Alex. Man, we're going to have to talk more about planting coffee trees out here. I'm not sure how well that will go, but uh, we, we can sort something out there. All right. Thanks, Matt. Alex, whenever you're ready, friend. All right. Thank you, Byron. Uh, great talk, Matt. Thank you for teeing me up pretty well here. Uh, yeah, like they said before, I'm Alex. I've only been working at JAX for about a year, so um, hopefully I can lend some insight into uh, the progress I've been able to make since Matt decided to stuff me in a van, take me down to Longmont, and make me take some soil cores. But yeah, I'm Alex. I'm a third-year PhD student out at Colorado State University, uh, working in Melinda Smith's lab, and a lot of my research is focused on how plants and microbial communities respond to drought and different global change drivers, and so I saw the solar array as a great opportunity to kind of investigate some of these closely linked plant soil interactions um, in a pretty cool context. So I'll start by hopefully convincing you all why soil is important, why you should listen to me for the next 15 minutes, and why you might consider incorporating some of these practices in your own solar array or whatever experiment you might be looking into. Uh, so yeah, for starters, it's pretty easy to ignore soil. It doesn't really move around or do anything that visually interesting. So why should you actually care about it. Uh, this visual, for instance, hits on a few of the major ecosystem services that soil contributes to, and I'd say that each of these is pretty critical to uh, sustaining life on the planet. Uh, it's taken for granted that we couldn't live without healthy soil, but I, I won't harp on it too long. You're all here, hopefully, because you're interested in understanding how these solar rays influence their environment, and we can't continue to keep overlooking the ground beneath us. So what can we learn from a single soil core? So I'll frame this in the context of JAX, but give you a little insight as far as uh, what a soil scientist might be interested in or just some general soil health indicators. Uh, so I'll start with soil pH at JAX Solar Garden is pretty neutral basic, it's around 7.45. The basic site is more common for Colorado given that it's more arid. Um, and so this is a measure of the amount of hydrogen ions in the soil, which is largely dictated by rainfall, parent material, et cetera. And this can inform the extent of biological activity that's possible in the soil. And so systems that experience limited rainfall like here tend to be a little more basic due to the accumulation of inorganic carbon or carbonates. Uh, but plants are typically well suited for these conditions. Uh, I'll move on next to electrical conductivity. This is kind of a measure of the ability of soil water to carry an electrical current, uh, which increases with the abundance of electrolytes. Uh, as this value goes up, it can be a little concerning 
as far as your soil becoming saline, given that salts are electrolytes. Um, so that's a, a value that's pretty easy to measure and pretty informative for your soil. Uh, next is organic matter content. You've probably heard of this before, but organic matter is just the measure of the living material or previously living material in the soil. Could be dead plant roots, microbes, earthworms, whatever was living at one point. Uh, most folks strive for higher organic matter because it improves soil structure, water holding capacity, buffers pH changes, just a million services that it provides. And this fraction of the soil is decomposed over time by the soil food web, which I'll get into shortly. Next is going to be total carbon and nitrogen, which really just indicates the amount of organic and inorganic carbon in the soils, which change over long time scales as environmental factors change. Um, total carbon in soils tends to hang out around 2 to 4%, but this changes based on management practices, biological activity, all kinds of things. And then looking at the ratio between total carbon and nitrogen can be pretty informative as far as how much nitrogen is available within your soil. Lastly, I'll move on to soil texture, just to express that at Jack Solar Garden, we have kind of a clay loam, sandy clay loam soil. This informs how water moves through the soil, how nutrients move through the soil, um, all kinds of things that are going on down there. And so you see that I left out a whole column called biological indicators. Um, there are a few measures here that it suggests, but it looks a lot more like this. Um, there's a lot going on, it can get messy. Uh, if this figure is overwhelming, that's the point. Uh, we're just gonna parse out a few of the interactions that are going on here because that's how you really start to get at mechanisms of what's going on down there. So I'll highlight a few plant soil interactions just so everybody's on the same page. Um, a major pathway through which plants get carbon into the soil is by exuding sugars, organic acids, all different kinds of molecules that plants make through photosynthesis into the soil. And so these are the food that microbes love to munch on, the bacteria, the fungi, the other protists and such in the soil. They need these sources of carbon to kind of build up their own bodies and um, start to transform other nutrients and really create that soil food web. And next, when plants die, they become another form of nutrient inputs into the soil. Um, and then the microbes below ground begin to process these carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, all these different macronutrients, um, and really just um, create the soil that we see. And each of these are forms of carbon inputs into the soil. You may have already caught on that I'm missing how carbon might be leaving the soil. A major source of carbon loss is through respiration. All of these little bugs down there, the bacteria, the fungi, a lot of them are heterotrophs, just like humans. As they eat their food, these carbon-based sources, they respire carbon dioxide, just like people do. Um, and so it's really important to consider that while we have all of these carbon inputs, we're going to have a lot of carbon losses as well. And it's really about trying to find the balance there and really get at what's going on. And now I'll get into our experiment. Like Matt said, we have this experimental design with the west edge of the panel beneath the panel, the eastern edge, and then kind of that inner panel space. Um, I won't harp on this too long, but we have a control that's kind of outside the array, not really affected by these um, alterations of abiotic inputs. And then I'll show you a figure a little later on that just has within the array, between panels, and the control. And I just want to emphasize that by within, I mean, within the range of the panel, so western edge to the eastern edge. Yeah, and just to reiterate some of the points that uh, Matt made as far as trends in abiotic factors and how that alters productivity and some of the patterns we've seen, when you introduce solar panels to a grassland, particularly Jack's solar garden, you see that soil moisture on the western edge increases because of those afternoon thunderstorms. It's lowest beneath the panels, and then the eastern edge and inner panel space are pretty similar to controls as far as soil moisture goes. We see those light trends that Matt mentioned, where underneath the panels obviously get the lowest amount of light, um, outside the panels get the highest amount of light. And then that translates into altered productivity patterns. And you'll see in this little inset here, that's just the figure that Matt showed, where we see the highest productivity consistently over the course of three years on the eastern edge of the panels, lowest underneath the panels. And so that really got me thinking, if we're seeing all of these interesting patterns above ground, that's a great opportunity to see what's going on with the little microbes below ground. Um, like I showed you earlier, there's a whole soil food web that's not just microbes, but you got to start somewhere. So that first measure that we saw in the biological activity of the soil health indicators is microbial biomass. And that's simply the amount of carbon or nitrogen present in a soil sample in microorganisms. 
Um, so microbes, like any organism, need carbon and nitrogen to build themselves. They're made of cells. So are we. And so measuring this is a great way to gain insight into the biological activity in the soil, which can inform us about processes like decomposition, overall nutrient cycling. And so microbial carbon, what I'm showing you in this figure here, is acquired from soil organic carbon and is often limited by the amount of soil organic carbon available, as well as other soil factors like pH, water availability, and general soil properties. We see a pretty interesting trend here that's kind of opposite to what we're seeing with the plant productivity, where microbial biomass carbon is highest directly underneath the panels. That's not at all what I hypothesize personally, so it's still a work in progress as far as figuring out why exactly this is going on. I currently think that this is because we had such a wet year and underneath the panels is probably the least stressful environment for soil communities. So they really just had the best of both worlds, plenty of water, some carbon to work with and not a ton of temperature or light stress. And so they went crazy. That's my working hypothesis, don't hold me to it. Next, we looked at nitrogen. Uh, microbial biomass nitrogen was relatively consistent across each of our microenvironments. But um, when we start to look at carbon to nitrogen ratios, we see that that spikes underneath the panels because of that high carbon directly underneath the panels. Looking specifically at the microbial biomass carbon to nitrogen ratios can kind of inform us if there's sufficient nitrogen available in the soil. Um, individuals often take this into account when considering fertilizer addition, especially if ratios exceed around 20 to 1, 25 to 1. That means there's a lot of carbon and a little bit of nitrogen. Uh, given that bacterial and fungal carbon to nitrogen ratios hang out between the 5 to 1 and 15 to 1 range, um, I would say that JAX is a pretty healthy refuge for microbes. Uh, of course, this changes depending on management, climate, and other factors, but I'd say this corresponds pretty well with what I've seen in other agricultural systems. So we see that the amount of microbes are different in different microclimates. So I was interested in seeing really who's there, who's making this happen. So to do that, you take a soil sample, you extract the DNA from it, and you sequence that on a sequencer. Um, very sciencey, that's what I think of. Um, but to get at what species are there, um, this plot you're seeing here is simply richness. That's just the amount of different species that are there. So. The middle line is 400. That would just mean 400 different bacterial species in a sample. And so these are showing the averages between or in that inner panel space outside the array in our control and within which is that Western edge to Eastern edge space that I showed you earlier. Um, not really a difference as far as how many different species are there. Um, so that's, don't really know what to make of that. But when we begin to look at who exactly it is down there, we start to see that there are some differences in, two, er, in the species that are making up these different components. And so this plot that I'm showing you here is called an ordination, uh, simply put. And so each point here is a different soil microbial community. So you take a sample, you sequence it, you have all these different species, and that's gonna make a single point. And so this, the circles or ellipses are the model's best way of grouping these samples together. And so you'll see on the left side that we have three triangles and a little blue ellipses. These are our samples that are outside the array. Those are our controls. Um, kind of towards the top center, you have some red circles. Those are in that inner panel space in our between. And then all these blue crosses are the within panel space. And you see that there's pretty substantial separation between these different um, subsets of microbial communities. So that would suggest that Although there aren't different numbers of species, the species that are there might be different. Um, and so I looked into which bacteria might be driving these differences, and I found that a large majority of these differences are being driven by this group of nitrifying bacteria called nitrososphere. Don't hold me to that either. Uh, but they help to transform ammonia into nitrate and just transforming nitrogen into a plant available form, simply put. And so they're typically in relatively high abundance in fields that have high nitrogen, formerly managed fields, which I think would fit the criteria of JAX pretty well. Um, and they can be pretty indicative of nitrogen levels. And so that's a great benefit of looking into bacterial and fungal communities is some of these indicator tags that can kind of tell you what's going on and um, some of the other complementary physiochemical properties of your soil can really um, reiterate that. But 
we see who's there, we see how much of them are there, but how does that actually translate into functionality? So if you'll remember that figure that I showed you earlier, you have plants feeding the soil microbes and you see that being lost is carbon dioxide. So there's a way for us to measure that in the lab. We take soil samples, we put them in these little wells, and then we feed them some plant-derived substances such as cellulose or lignin, glucosamine. And um, we cap them and we measure how much carbon dioxide is lost from these little plates over time. And that tells us how quickly these soil microbial communities are breaking down these substrates. And yeah, this acts as a, a measure of how these microbial communities are functioning in the natural system. And so you'll see some of the trends here that the eastern edge is cycling through these carbon-based compounds a little faster than any of the other microclimates. But we see that underneath the panels is kind of intermediate. It really depends on the compound that you're feeding them. So contextualizing this with the other data that we have has been kind of a challenge. We're working on it right now, but we're seeing pretty interesting trends and everything is not linear across these different microclimates. So what this tells me is that when you go and you install solar panels, it's really important to consider how these changes in environmental conditions might cascade below ground and affect overall nutrient cycling in your system. That's going to affect how plants grow. It's going to affect how much carbon is put back into the atmosphere, managers, if you should fertilize, a lot of things to be taken into consideration here. Of course, like I said, this was my first time sampling out of Jack, so there's a lot more that can be done here. This was kind of an exploratory initial analysis, so I think it would be great to investigate these dynamics over time and space. We had the benefit of doing this over a whole growing season, but multiple growing seasons where you um, get different water availability, maybe it's a little bit hotter one year than the other. I don't know. It would be great to see if these things change over time. Um, we also did it over a couple of transects on one side of the solar array. Maybe that might be different over on the other side of the solar array. Who knows? We'll find out. Um, it would also be helpful to look at other functional measures of um, enzyme activity, gene expression, just trying to get at what they're doing underground. And then, like Matt said earlier, we have the benefit of working in a monoculture of Bromus and Hermes. That really has helped me get at one single species interacting with the below ground communities. That's going to change if the plant communities above ground are changing too. Um, so lots to look at, very exciting, but got to make sense of what we're finding out here first. Um, so that's my time. I want to thank you all for coming and uh, hearing me out. Feel free to email me at any point with any questions about soil stuff. I'd love to chat. Thanks. Thanks much, Alex. And uh, we'll look forward to look forward to asking you a couple questions there. And for our participants, uh, please feel free to start populating the Q and A with any questions that you have. And uh, once uh, Chris is finished with his presentation, we'll get around to your questions and and started asking these gentlemen uh, what's on your mind. All right, go ahead, Chris. All right. Is that, let's see, showing up? Well, you can see it. Excellent. All right, well, it's good to talk with you all today. Um, today, I'm gonna talk about managing these ecovoltaic systems for the goal of providing ecosystem services. So, Matt and Alex basically talked to you about mechanisms. They were a little more um, granular in that way as far as what's actually driving these uh, ecological patterns and responses of these communities. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of scale up beyond those mechanisms and talk about it in a way that's essentially um, how is this relevant to us as people? You know, what are the sort of benefits or downsides of these various things? So this is going to be a more applied talk in that way. Um, my advisor is Dr. Megan Shapansky. I study in the agroecology lab, um, and I have some excellent assistants named Nelson and Brittany who have helped me with this project. Um, so a little bit of background on Jax um, and solar array construction generally. So typically solar array construction is quite... Um, disruptive to the communities, the vegetative communities and the soil. And this is uh, a photo from Jax of an area where a lot of heavy machinery was taken around the transformer and the drive path on the edge of the field. And this is typically what the entire fields of, of many solar arrays have looked like post-construction historically. Um, but Jax Solar Garden 
was developed using these low impact installation techniques. And so this is a photo um, directly after construction, August 2020, before it was even electrified. Um, and you can see that there's probably a good, at least 90% vegetative cover remaining. Um, so the installers took great lengths and were very successful in preserving the existing vegetative community. Not only were they successful in preserving vegetative cover, but these bulk density measurements, which uh, you can essentially think of as a measure of soil compaction, um, show that there's not really any practically relevant uh, soil compaction that has occurred um, within the solar array compared to our control area outside of the solar array. Actually, the bulk density is surprisingly a little higher outside of the solar array. Um, so, so we're definitely not seeing substantial compaction three years out. It's, it's really not an issue at all. So this begged the question for us of, okay, we know that if you have a really degraded site, it's a good thing to go in there and revegetate with native species specifically. This has been um, proposed as a sort of way to manage for ecosystem services because these native species uh, have what we would call co-evolutionary histories with other organisms in the region along with um, localized adaptations. But if we actually have a healthy pasture in place, not a degraded site, it, it begs the question of, well, is it worth it to go in and intercede these native species when it is a relatively difficult and sometimes costly um, procedure? And so that's exactly what we went to try and figure out. Now, I've, I've talked about this term ecosystem services a number of times. Matt and Alex have also mentioned this. So for anybody who doesn't know, I want to kind of unpack this just a little bit. Um, the general definition we use for ecosystem services is the benefits people obtain from ecosystems. It's really pretty a pretty simple definition. Um, and my favorite example of this is uh, New York City a number of years back had deteriorating water quality that was um, going below acceptable levels. And so proposals were brought to the city to build a new water filtration plant to bring that back up to acceptable levels. Um, but other groups proposed watershed restoration in uh, the Catskill, Delaware watersheds and the Croton watersheds, which feed New York City water. And after penciling this all out, it was discovered that they could achieve better water quality with less cost by um, improving the ecosystem health of the watersheds that feed the city. So this is an excellent example of ecosystem services because they didn't even have to build a water filtration plant. You can see from this uh, little figure here with the tap that over nine years, they saved somewhere on the order of 6.5 to $8 billion using this method instead of building um, a filtration plant. So ecosystem services are potentially very valuable, even though they're not, um, or at least many of them are not, uh, products that you would buy and sell on a market, um, such as um, agricultural goods or timber, which are a form of ecosystem services as well. Um, but often when I personally talk about them, I'm really more referring to these um, somewhat more intangible uh, benefits that we get from ecosystems. So on to what we actually did. Within the area we were given at Jack's Solar Garden, we established three different vegetative communities. So the introduced pasture that you see on the left here was the existing vegetation. That's sort of the status quo for the site. And then on the other two thirds of our area, we tilled up the existing, uh, the existing pasture vegetation and uh, planted native species, either a balanced mix of native wildflowers and grasses or a mix that skewed heavily toward the wildflowers. Then each of those three vegetation communities was combined with either receiving supplemental irrigation or receiving just ambient precipitation conditions for water. And this was all laid out in what we would call a randomized complete block design. So each of those six combinations are present 
in all four blocks. So they're all replicated four times within the solar array. And then additionally, outside of the solar array as a control uh, so that we can understand some of the differences between not just these vegetation treatments and irrigation treatments, but the impact of the solar array itself. So getting into some of the results, I'm gonna start uh, with biomass productivity. Matt went into a lot more detail about this, so I'm kind of gonna skim over it, but mainly what you see here is based on these different vegetation treatments. So the natives being over here and then the introduced pasture on the right, you can see that they, that introduced pasture, the sort of status quo vegetation on the site, um, way out produced the native plots. But this, I wanna make it clear that this was not due to the um, type of vegetation itself, but rather the manner in which these systems were managed. So I say that this is due to compensatory regrowth. What that means is that these pasture plots were being cut twice in a year. So once around June and again around mm, maybe September or so. Um, and that when, when a plant is cut in that way, it has a pressure to put on new above ground biomass. And so that sort of drives it to produce additional um, versus the native species treatments in order to fulfill the function of providing resources to pollinators and other wildlife, they are only mowed once at the end of the season in order to let them complete their full life cycle. And so they don't experience this compensatory regrowth phenomenon because they're not being cut. Um, so this is really a management difference that we're seeing. Now, what you can see here, and this is kind of a busy figure, I apologize, but um, this is all of them grouped together, all the different treatments, and just looking at the effect of the microclimates uh, that, the, that are created by the solar array on the different um, nutritional, like kind of macronutrients present in the forage. So protein in blue, fat in red, and starch in green. Protein is the most important of these, so I'll kind of draw your eye mainly to the blue. Um, and what you can see is that there's this sort of inverse relationship with biomass production. It's not perfectly so, um, but the under where you're getting the least biomass has the highest protein content versus, uh, this is for 2023, in the control where we got the most biomass, you're seeing actually the lowest protein content. And this is fairly expected. This is not a, an unusual finding, but it's interesting to see because as Matt was explaining, you know, we're seeing this depression in the underneath plot as far as total produced, but if the quality is actually going up, well then maybe these sites are actually maintaining the quality of the grassland for grazers or for cutting um, for hay, even despite some of the reduction in biomass productivity, if it balances out with the nutritive content. And so the final thing I'll show you with this is um, th these are weighted averages, so taking into account how much of each plot um, is, is composed of that under or the edges or the open areas. And so this is sort of, if you were to look at it at a whole field scale, you can see that the pasture, the introduced pasture vegetation absolutely um, is the winner here. It's producing more biomass and it is also producing higher quality biomass for grazers. So that's, that's our forage quality data. The next ecosystem uh, service I'd like to discuss is creating pollinator habitat. And this could um, apply more broadly to wildlife habitat when you're establishing these systems. But the measure we looked at specifically was uh, blooms. So every week we would go out and we would count and identify what types of flowers were blooming down to the species level across all those different microclimates. And what we saw was that unsurprisingly that pasture vegetation has pretty low blooms because we're cutting it when it's going to bloom because that's when the forage quality is the highest. So this is depressed due to management. And then the others that were planted with natives, that balanced mix and the wildflower heavy mix on the right, um, do show higher floral resources for pollinators. Now, okay, that's not surprising. 
you plant wildflower seeds and you get more wildflowers. Okay, this, whatever, this guy's talking about some boring stuff. But what's really interesting here is that the irrigation, the difference between dry land and irrigated, actually showed that the dry land treatments were the ones that had the better establishment of these native species. And this was surprising to us because often irrigation is recommended in semi-arid and arid regions for getting these plantings established. Um, and what I think was probably happening here is that that very robust smooth brome, if you are at all familiar with smooth brome, you'll know it is a heck of a plant. It really wants to live. And so <laughs> even after tillage, I think that additional water actually gave the existing smooth brome rhizomes more of an edge than the little seeds, which um, essentially had a, a more immature physiology, even though they were not subjected to the stresses of tillage. Um, and so what this would suggest is that, you know, if you are revegetating a more degraded site, then yeah, there's probably not going to be any um, potential downsides of using irrigation here. But if you have this sort of situation like Jack's, where the um, existing vegetation was maintained in good health, then the irrigation may may not be as useful because it might be giving an edge to that vegetation. That's my working hypothesis. Um, I'm not entirely sure that that's what's happening, but I, I do think it's a reasonable a reasonable hypothesis as to why this pattern would be emerging. And so finally, moving on from the pollinator habitat, the last ecosystem service that I want to talk about is carbon sequestration. And so over here on the left, you'll see that uh, a graph showing annual fine root productivity. And so uh, we used a method called root ingrowth cores to basically see how, what quantity of, of fine roots was being produced on an annual basis. Um, a problem with understanding below ground biomass in these perennial ecosystems like grasslands is that a lot of the, the root mass is standing, it carries over from year to year. Not all of it, but much of it. And so if you just go and take a soil pour and wash the soil off and count, uh, weigh the roots, you're not sure what's from this year or what's from another year. And so it's not really temporally specific, but this method lets us get specific to the year. Now, as Alex mentioned, this is not even close to a complete accounting of the carbon going into the soil from the plants, right? We have exudates, we have more coarse roots that are also going into the soil. But what you can think of this graph on the left as is sort of a proxy for carbon inputs to the soil, okay? And you can see that at least statistically, there's not really there's not really much variation between the different microclimates we see. And you can see that there's also um, no significant effect of the vegetation type or irrigation type, uh, which was a little bit surprising. Um, now moving on to this right side, keeping in mind that the left is representative of carbon inputs, this right graph is representative of carbon outputs from the soil. And so you can see that there is a much larger effect on this side of the microclimates created by the solar array, all of them showing lower carbon losses than the control outside of the array. So if we put these two findings together, this isn't going to be a real numerical um, like I can't tell you how much this is shifting, but what it would suggest is that if inputs are staying steady with maybe a slight depression in the um, under microclimate, but losses are decreasing rather substantially, then that would suggest that that um, balance equation for carbon in versus out is shifting in favor of putting carbon in and keeping it in more effectively. Um, so we have more work to do to kind of get this to effective numbers that we could use and say, oh, you know, over time we're shifting the carbon balance equation this much. Um, but this is suggestive that the simple presence of the solar array, at least in this type of climate and above this type of vegetation, actually helps with the process of carbon sequestration into the soil.
which is quite an exciting finding, I think. And so here's sort of um, the last list of conclusions and discussion. This is really sort of a rehash of a lot of what I've talked about. Um, the main thing that I really want to touch on is this sort of main trade-off here. So with the carbon sequestration, right, we didn't see any real difference between the vegetation and irrigation treatments. It was just a difference between the solar microclimates or being outside of the solar array. On the other hand, the forage productivity and the, um, the pollinator habitat show a pretty direct trade-off that is related to management of these systems, what they need in order to function for either forage productivity and grazing or as wildlife habitat. And so it's important to for developers and communities to kind of understand this trade-off and prioritize what's important to them. Um, so that they can get the best outcomes that they want from these systems. And that's all I have for you. So thank you all for turning in and I look forward to the Q&A session. Well, we can get that Q&A going right now. So please uh, keep putting in your questions into the Q&A button at the bottom and I'll, I'm gonna take a privilege to ask a few questions to get going back in the way that we started, Matt. Um, you talked some about the vegetation being light limited and or water limited. Uh, could you give some examples of how this may change in other geographic zones? Sure. So light limited would be if there's a couple different ways to discuss light limited and water limited. So light limited would be there's like a metabolic version of that where photosynthesis is limited by the um the intensity of light and then you'd also have photos or productivity being limited by the just magnitude of light total over the entire day or growing season so in colorado we get a ton of solar irradiance so it's a lot different here when i say light limitation light limitation given that like full sunlight being protected by full sun from full sunlight here would probably be of interest to plants rather than if you were in the Northeast or something where it's a lot more cloud cover. It's a lot less direct intense sunlight. It's also a lot different angle of the sun at higher latitudes. So if you think about like Minnesota or upstate New York, so yeah, if, if that's what you're referring to, there's a lot of different light limitation, water limitation things that'll happen, but when we think about at least the like ecovoltaic approach to these rangeland systems or pollinator systems and how we want to develop them in the future, it's trying to design them specific to those ecosystems so we can enhance those ecosystems directly. And when you talked about uh, our grasses being uh, mountain smooth brome, that's a C3 cool season grass. Uh, you said that the, it seemed like you were saying that the smooth brome was benefiting from the shade to some degree. I, I'd be curious if you would see similar interactions with other types of C3s and what you think would happen with C4 grasses, which are warm season grasses. Yeah, so that's a phenomenal question. The what we what we have kind of dug into a little bit with grow room experiments, so not in the field, so not the same type of like ecological like insight that we'd get from doing it in the field, but. In a grow room, we've actually tested two hours, four hours, six hours, eight hours, and 10 hours of direct sunlight. And then the rest would just be diffuse sunlight. So very intense sunlight, then ramping it back down to just what like diffuse, like underneath a panel would be. And we actually see that <laughs> these C4 grasses, which are adapted to high light, really high temperatures, and mostly occur in these drier environments, do just fine and grow just fine in four hours of direct sunlight. So that's a lot. Like it's, it's not a huge reversal on what we know. It's just no one's even thought really about like <laughs> what is the low end of what C4 grasses will need to photosynthesize and be productive. And I think what we're finding out through a lot of research is that it's about the timing of when light happens, not the amount of light that hits plants. So trying to alleviate stress with the afternoons, more shade in the afternoons, more light in the morning, reducing the actual time of direct sunlight isn't as big of a concern as when that time, when that sunlight occurs. So being when it's hotter or cooler out, you say. Yep. Yeah. 
Thanks. Uh, Alex, uh, you mainly talked about bacteria. Will you be looking into fungi, protozoa, and flagellates this coming year? Yes, I, I'm waiting on the fungal sequencing data to come back. I just haven't gotten that yet. That should be here tomorrow, actually, so just bad timing on my end. Uh, uh, but I will be looking into that, <laughs> into that as well. Um, I believe Isabella... Doo -doo. Yes, Isabel brought up a great question about fungal bacterial ratios. That was originally what I sought to do because that gives us a more concrete balance between these two groups of microbes rather than just kind of looking at who's there and their relative abundances. That tells us how much of each of those groups are there. Uh, sadly, I wasn't able to pull that off this year, but next year, that's one of my primary goals. So um, absolutely, in short. And, and some of the conversation was around um, carbon sequestration and carbon emissions from what we were talking about with the, within the grasslands. Uh, what, what type of microbes are, would you say are the main indicators for uh, either carbon in or carbon out? Yeah, that so... Might, Chris, I'm not sure. It's, I uh, think the microbes uh, will be better directed to Alex, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Right on. Um, yeah, I, there's been a little bit of research looking into slow versus fast carbon cycling soils and what microbes tend to inhabit those. And it seems like uh, fields that tend to be left alone, restored uh, for a little while and not so actively intensively managed um, tend to become fungal dominated. And so they're better capable of breaking down these harder to break down compounds, sort of like the lignin, the more recalcitrant plant compounds. Um, and that sort of slows carbon release into the atmosphere. As you build up these fungal networks, more of that is being stored below ground. Um, but as you disturb the soil, whether it's through tilling, installation, compaction, whatever it is, um, that tends to change the microbial communities towards the more bacterial dominated communities where they can cycle through these carbon sources um, a lot faster. Of course, as the microbes die, they can become also more recalcitrant carbon by um, attaching to the minerals that are present in the soil. So it's a very dynamic system, but as far as like overarching trends, more fungal dominated bacterial systems tend to carbon or cycle carbon more slowly and store more below ground, bacterial dominated are faster. I would actually, I, I'd like to ask my own follow-up question to you on that, Alex. Do you think, um, or rather does the research suggest that this is in fact related to the identity of these microbes or is it just sort of a disturbance intensity thing that's occurring? Um, a little bit of both. It's relatively young. So it's a lot of the findings have been more so towards like major groups. Um, there are a lot of shortcomings as far as identifying microbes down to species. So it's kind of tough to make those broad trends. We can get at some of the functions that microbes do, but as far as contextualizing those and actually getting at functions, um, that's very fresh. And I don't want to draw any huge generalizations. Um, so that's kind of why I did the substrate induced respiration assays to start getting at that, throw some data out there. But um, yeah, hopefully that answered your question and just answer it. Yeah. Well, and for Chris, uh, one of your graphs uh, was around protein percentage in the in the grasses. There was that a comparison uh, solely within the solar array and not to the control that you had outside. No, there was ones that um, the one that showed specifically the microclimate variation without um, factoring in the vegetative community also in, factored into the those controls. Gotcha. So, and, and and my understanding was that it the, there was higher protein content and a certain microclimate within the solar array versus outside. Correct. Yes. Yes. Why would that be? Yeah. So that's kind of that inverse relationship that I was describing with biomass and um, nutritive content. It's essentially like as the plants sort of put on more cellulose and get more mature, that some of that those nutritive compounds just sort of get diluted essentially. And so you could think for yourself, do you prefer to consume tender spring greens or do you prefer to consume like raw kale? I'm sure there's some raw kale enjoyers out there. Uh, I do not number among them. <laughs> um, and so it's a similar phenomenon that, that you're seeing with the grasses. Okay, interesting. I, I know... Uh... Grazers are always interested in finding higher protein content for their for their animals. Well, uh, those are my questions. We'll turn over to uh, where you fellas have been answering some questions on here. Let's see. Uh, we'll start with uh, 
is someone developing studies that compare not only agrivoltaics versus a regular crop, but also versus, for example, partial shading of trees? Whoever so, wants to do it. You would like to answer that? Is that true? <laughs> yeah, I think that that's a, it's a very complex question and that's why no one's done a direct experiment testing that all in one spot. But I think that that was the original hypotheses that we were all using for what we think would happen in these co-located grassland and photovoltaic areas was what happens in savannas and what happens in civil pastures. So I think uh, no one has done that, but that the idea is that photovoltaics above grass will do the exact same thing in alleviating some of those stressful conditions that trees do without competing for any of the resources. So without having any of those negative effects that a tree would have on grasses because they are competing for the same sort of pools of resources, especially in stressful conditions, it's probably better to be under a solar array than a tree in stressful conditions. But obviously for, if we're talking about like sustainability issues, that's having a monoculture is not as good as having a silver pasture. So yeah, there's a lot of complexity to that, but that's my answer. I think one of the main differences between these systems is the way the the shade moves in these very stark bands across the landscape in the agrivoltaic systems versus you get a more dappled shade and kind of diffuse light environment in the silver pastures and agroforestry systems. I'll move on to Elijah's. We have uh, curious if you have seen proof of concept regarding utilizing agrivoltaics as a means to conserve water historically utilized through center pivot irrigation systems, primarily for alfalfa and hay cultivation. Specifically, have you observed proof of concept if or in following the corners of these farms, converting the corners to PV arrays and maintaining cultivation on the balance of the ground? I, you know, I, I hear that one quite a lot from uh, farmers and ranchers that are interested in using these corners. And I think from a solar design perspective, if you're just, uh, that you, you get economies of scale by the larger the, the solar array you build. And if you're only using a small corner here and then way over there, you're doing another small corner and way over there, you're doing another small corner. Now you're exceeding costs by, uh, running transmission lines in between all of these uh, different corners. I, I haven't heard of too many people being interested in just corners on say one square, but if you had uh, four squares and then there was a corner, uh, the cor four corners that touched each other, now you have a diamond, maybe you could put in a, a solar array that matches all of those. That's from the electrical side. I'll pass it over to you all to talk about the, the water side. So we've done a little bit of work on, we had some really high resolution water balance uh, measurements that we did over the course of an entire year at JAX actually. And we did some modeling with that to understand evapotranspiration throughout the entire pasture inside the array versus outside the array. And you actually get a pretty significant amount of evapotranspiration um, reduction, right? So you're gonna lose less water inside the array than you will outside the array. And that was actually in a relatively wet year. so. If you imagine that that's going to be, um, I guess, multiplied or magnified in a more intense, stressful year, which we haven't had yet when we've been studying jacks, we've had nice wet years, all the grass looks nice and green, but that's kind of where we'll get more insight into that response. And then to get at um, Byron's point as well, what's really interesting, and I've talked to a lot of people in the San Luis Valley about this stuff, is thinking about how you could take these large sections of previously irrigated cropland, put them into PV, you'd reduce evapotranspiration, so you'd keep some more water in the soil, but then you also potentially recharge aquifers. But then it's it's this other complex thing of aquifer recharge in the San Luis Valley is not just directly tied to reducing evapotranspiration. So there's a lot that has to be done with water, especially in the state of Colorado, to understand how those things influence at the ecosystem level. But yeah. That's that's where I'm at. I'm sure other people have something to say. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would just say briefly, rereading this question, that um, I think it, it seemed to be suggesting that they would remain center pivot irrigated under this scenario. Um, and so I don't think that putting 
um, solar panels on these corners where they're not actually being cultivated do really much of much of anything for water balance. It would be more of a question of essentially converting the energy used for pumping this water and irrigating into a renewable form, which there there's a lot of interest in, especially for more remote farms that may not be grid tied, right? I mean, it's kind of a long standing issue in the agronomy of like, what the heck do we do with these field <laughs> corners? Like they kind of just sit there. <laughs> right. Totally like an ag agricultural application and solution, but like an ecosystem level, probably nothing because that water is going to be in that corner still. It's not really going to help the crops much. Yeah. I'll bring back up one question John had that uh, you were answering online there, Matt. Uh, has anyone experimented with looking to utilizing higher water concentration off the western edge of the panels to help via irrigation distribution? Um, uh, distributing the water into other areas on the parcel. So that's, yeah. So to add to the, what I already said, and I'll recap it too, in other states where you actually get <laughs> like substantial rainfall, where maybe it's too much rainfall on an edge, they have, they're definitely looking into different array designs where you can change where the rainfall goes. You can also have uh, tracking algorithms where like if it's raining, you can balance out where rain is falling. So it's not all just happening wherever the angle of the sun might be. So that would be like another ecovoltaic approach, trying to like think about the ecosystem underneath, not just thinking about are we maximizing solar produ or energy production when it's raining, which is negligible anyway. So that's one part of it. Um, oh man, just <laughs> what was the just someone give me one. Matt, before you keep going. <laughs> oh, what Go was ahead. okay. Uh, so I was gonna say before you keep going, I've heard of these algorithms for redistributing rain, but you mentioned uh, array design factors uh -huh. as well. What is being explored for that? Yep. So there's some things, and then this really gets into like water politics too, of like what can you do with water when it falls? And like in Colorado, this is a big deal, but a lot of other places it's not. So there's like designs where you invert them both to the middle. So you're just redistributing all of the rainfall to one place and then you fill up tubs and you use those either for um, like livestock water or you use it for watering crops in like an adjacent field if you get that much rainfall. In Colorado, at one point, I, that's the point I wanted to come back to. In Colorado, the rainfall is so limited that although you're getting like magnification or amplification of rainfall on panel edges right now, it's still like... 10 millimeters of rainfall like when you like amplify it so it's it's almost almost nothing and if you try to transport it or collect it it's probably like not enough to do anything with anyway beyond potentially in a super wet year having some livestock use it but yeah that's my opinion at least i i was also told if i put uh gutters on my panels i would void the warranty of them so hence we have not done that here on site and that's above all. <laughs> above all. Uh, put the farm up as collateral to the bank and need to stay living here. So I've got to <laughs> keep costs down. Um, let's see. Beth had asked, uh, I would, or stated, I would expect that natives would be better in native non-irrigated areas. Yeah. So what I'm referring to is specifically establishment. And so what we see in a lot of semi-arid and arid ecosystems is that, yes, once established, these plants absolutely outcompete more humid adapted species um, when they're in these dry land conditions. However, establishment of plants tends to occur relatively infrequently. So like my undergraduate work was in uh, Joshua Tree National Park, where it's really, really dry. And the graduate student that I was working with was super excited to see a single new Laria tridentata seedling. And he had been working there for years and the experiment had been existing for 30 years. It was like a long-term ecological site. Um, and he found one new one and he was kind of freaking out. So it was because it was a, a really wet year the previous year. And so that's why I said that it, using this irrigation specifically for this establishment phase. It wouldn't be the intention that this would necessarily continue after you've successfully established these native plantings. Thanks, Chris. Uh, I think that runs through the majority of them there. 
I, I wanted to put it back to you if there was any other points that you all forgot to make during your presentations or you want to hammer home for the audience. Yeah, I guess on my end, um, something I forgot to mention, but kind of implied to its beginning there with those soil health indicators is that a lot of the physical and chemical properties that I showed you, such as like pH, organic matter, total carbon and nitrogen, those are relatively easy to measure or have a lab nearby measure, and they can tell you a lot about your system. So don't be swayed away by all the biological stuff and the sequencing and having to look at microbial biomass. There's a lot you can learn about your soil and from your soil. Uh, just by taking a sample and looking for a lab nearby. Yeah, it'll nice. cost you like 20 bucks. Can confirm. <laughs> <laughs> nice soil plug. Yeah, I, as a as far as soils go too, um, it's not from Jax, but we've been sampling some sites that are older, like 14 years old. And a lot of the stuff that Alex and Chris have been talking about today is like, that's sort of the patterns that we're ending up seeing. We're seeing higher carbon and we're also seeing like different pools of carbon so like longer more stable carbon inside the array because of that reduced stress on plants so and also the uh redistribution of water inside of the arrays so we'll be hopefully getting that out sometime this year but yeah pretty cool stuff all the better if you do um well you know i would point out to our audience that uh, these folks are working within a solar array that was built to maximize energy production. The the panels are or the the distance between the panels when they're flat is about eleven feet from middle of post to post or uh, center to center is a seventeen foot on center. Uh, single axis tracking system. The main three things that we changed to allow for uh, researchers crop growth, uh, the the peppermint and lemon balm. Uh, that Matt was talking about, as well as cattle that we've had out on site, is elevating the panels up a little bit higher because people need space, machinery needs space, vegetation needs space, uh, having improved wire management, keeping them out of the way uh, from people, animals, uh, machinery, so any interaction with the wires, a bad interaction, and then also reducing land degradation, as Chris uh, talked about during his, his talk. You could see that there was a portion of the solar array that did get damaged thoroughly during the, the construction phase. And that side has not uh, fully healed yet after going on uh, four years. And uh, within the solar array, any of that area seems that I, I don't see any ruts and spaces in the solar array anymore uh, where there would have been any damage. So having um, having work or work, working with your your installer, your construction company, to build a solar array in a way that uh, does as little damage to the ground as possible provides uh, long-term benefits to that soil. Uh, okay. our soil Just uh, briefly, what did yeah, that involve uh, when you were working with the developer? What were some of the things that they specifically did to reduce impacts? Uh, namely designating driving spaces and reducing the traffic on site. Uh, you, you can easily see any locations where a vehicle has gone over a, a path more than once, it starts to beat up the ground. Even where our farmers are out there walking the same path over and over, maybe you've been on a college campus where kids take a shortcut across the, the sidewalk, that area just gets beaten to hell because it's just constantly compacted down. Whereas if the uh, the weight of the vehicles, the, the movements were uh, spread more, I, I would suppose not uh, not continuously compacted on any one given spot, then it would have less damage overall. Or you could designate one specific area that does get compacted down while the other areas don't get as much. Um, th those are things that we talked about and also having people not park on site, but park off site. I've seen uh, aerial images of locations where people are allowed to drive their pickup trucks anywhere on site and the entire area just gets completely degraded. Um, all right, last question I saw here is uh, what's the KW of the site? It is a 1.2 megawatt DC, uh, 960 kilowatt AC system. The solar panels cover just over four acres of land. But uh, I don't see uh, more questions popping up here. I appreciate you all's time and uh, listening to these gentlemen uh, today share about what they've been learning underneath uh, our solar panels. I certainly learned something. I appreciate that. I look forward to continuing to hear more about what you all do out here. And if 
any of our participants are interested in getting an in-depth uh, two-day uh, experience at Jack Solar Garden, we are hosting a workshop May 30th and 31st, uh, and again on August 15th and 16th. You all can reach out, uh, sign up online, and we would see you out here. But gentlemen, thank you for your time. Thank you, Byron. Yeah, right. it was Everybody take care. Have a good rest of your day. Bye-bye.